Good evening, everyone, and welcome to what I feel sure is going to be an excellent, excellent evening for everyone involved. My name is Colin Tishaw, and I'm here on behalf of the Laurel Foundation as a director, and we have the other directors in the front row here. See, they put me in front of this, so I didn't sit in one of the other seats there. And the Laurel Foundation has been uh, supporting uh, autism spectrum disordered challenges for about uh, 25 years now and then moved into the mental health spectrum to broaden some of the definitions because of the, you know, the, the difficulties and the fine differentiations between one thing and the other. Um, we tend to support projects as models. We're not a big foundation, but the foundation has been looking to see that uh, any model or any project which we support would, could be replicated. And through the replication, there would be the efficiencies of scale, or the economies of scale, or the uh, social or organizational multipliers. And just coincidentally, uh, on our website, one of our, one of our uh, descriptors is a better quality of life. And so it's very exciting that tonight um, there will be this issue examined. And the work that Emily is doing is extremely important. And we're very proud to be supporting this research. And I think that the illustrious panel members that we have here this evening to help us through some of the questions and challenges involved reflects how important it is. And your presence here is also very encouraging because it's with your input and questions and, and concerns that can direct the research, which is not in the formative stages, but still can be adjusted as it evolves. So tonight, the research presentation will hopefully facilitate um, involvement on the behalf of community organizations, government, and provide feedback. Um, and it will be the beginning of a long conversation. Uh, the process will examine and monitor and understand and evaluate uh, and make recommendations in this whole field of the quality of life for families, which will improve the, 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 the quality for the individuals uh, for whom we're all here to represent tonight. So thank you for coming, and uh, we're delighted to be part of this and are very pleased and proud to present the SFU research team who's making all of this possible. Thank you, Colin. Um, we very much appreciate the support of the Laurel Foundation. It's not easy getting grants to do research nowadays. Uh, <laughs> And um, so I'm uh, Grace Yadochi. I'm the director of the Autism Lab at SFU. Uh, I just want to tell you very quickly, um, we, we are very interested in the social development of children in general, and specifically uh, social development and social competence in children with ASD. Um, we are also interested in mental health and um, most recently, family quality of life, family well-being. Um, so this is an initiation of a new line of research, and Emily will be the lead researcher, and she's um, really excited about tonight because she hopes to get as much input as possible from everyone. Um, and uh, of course, if you have comments or questions that you would like to relay to us by email as well, uh, we'll be uh, looking to that, uh, and we'll be putting up our contact. Actually, it's right there. Um, so I just want to be very quick in um, uh, laying down some guidelines for tonight's discussion. Um, so one of the things uh, we thought, because we have such limited time, is that we want to make this um, um, uh, this evening um, as as, uh, as we want to get as much input from everyone. So to keep your comments as brief as possible. Um, so everyone can have a turn. Um, the other um, main point uh, would be to keep your comments as solution focused. Um, we want tonight to be very productive in terms of thinking of ways that we can learn more about family quality of life, um, what are some of the challenges and what are some possible ideas that you have also in terms of solutions. Um, and ways to go forward. Um, we are videotaping tonight's um, event so that other people who couldn't make it tonight will be able to view it on our website. Um, and
And um, if you want to direct your questions to a specific panelist, um, you can see their names listed up here, or you can direct your questions to the whole panel, the panel as a whole. Uh, if you need to take a washroom break, just out the door and to your left, okay? Um, I think that's all the rules that I have for tonight. Okay, I'm going to pass it on to Emily now. Okay. Okay, so my name is Emily Gardner. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. And I'm a doctoral candidate in the Autism and Developmental Disorders Lab at SFU. Um, we're thrilled to be a part of this event, and we're really looking forward to hearing both from our panelists and from our audience. So thank you so much for, uh, for being involved tonight, and a special thank you uh, to the Laurel Foundation for supporting this event. Uh, family well-being is a topic of great interest to me, and it's, it's what I plan to focus my research on, and that's specifically family quality of life, and specifically family quality of life uh, in families caring for a child with ASD. So this is a very complex kind of concept, but uh, the general kind of consensus definition at this time is, is that it, it, it refers to uh, conditions where the family's needs are met and family members enjoy their life together as a family uh, and have a chance to do things which are important to them. It involves a dynamic and ever-changing sense of well-being and it is collectively and subjectively defined and informed and individual and family level needs interact. Uh, after a thorough review of the literature in this area, I would say that there's really a huge range in terms of uh, the ways families describe the impact of, of caring for a child with ASD. Uh, but what also becomes really overwhelmingly apparent is that the issues that uh, families of children with ASD are experiencing are very different from those uh, experienced by families of children with other kinds of developmental disabilities. And that might be in terms of uh, accessing service, um, tra transition issues, public awareness, family involvement, to name only a few. And to this point, most research has considered disability very generally and looked at family quality of life issues broadly across different diagnoses. So we think it's important to focus on ASD specifically and uh, to give voice to some of the unique issues that are facing these families. Uh, we also think it's important to consider family quality of life at different stages for both the child and the family. So what kinds of issues uh, come up for families of children entering school that are different from those facing families of young adults? Or, or what might present for families at different transition points across their life cycle? And the aim of asking these questions and raising these discussion points is to help us identify uh, both risk and protective factors. Um, so suggestions for improvement can ultimately be made. In particular, what kinds of factors contribute to families feeling both satisfied and dissatisfied with their quality of life? And most importantly, how can we use this information to promote family resilience? Uh, so now we'll hear from each of the panelists, and then uh, we really want to hear from you. So we hope you're thinking of questions and discussion points, and I'll turn it over to Karen. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Emily, and thanks for having uh, me here and us here tonight. We really appreciate it. And thanks for coming, everybody, on a Friday night. I know everyone's putting it on their Facebook page that this is where they are. Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is Karen Bopp. I work for the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Uh, my background uh, area is I started my career out as a speech-language pathologist. Um, I started about 20 years ago working uh, in a preschool in uh, uh, Delta, uh, working with kids with ASD. And at that time, it was the only provincially funded service for kids with ASD. And we provided services to three kids in the morning and three kids in the afternoon, six. Currently, our prevalence numbers are around one in around every 84, 88 children uh, in this province have a diagnosis of ASD. So things have changed a lot over the last uh, 20 years. Um, uh, so I, I spent the beginning of my career uh, doing that. I then co-founded the Early Intensive Behavior Intervention Program at uh, Surrey Langley Delta. Uh, and then went on to do my PhD in special education. And I've been with the ministry since 2008. 
Uh, and my job there is basically to provide uh, content uh, expertise and sort of uh, be sort of a conduit towards um, the autism community uh, for them. So um, we spend a lot of my time over the past year, we've actually gone to over 23 communities in rural and remote, uh, actually just targeting rural remote communities uh, over this past year and uh, provided workshops directly to families. And so we've heard a lot of uh, feedback from families and in, in from you know, it, it's great we're here in the Lower Mainland, but what about Dawson Creek? What about uh, Terrace? That sort of thing, too. So I'd be really interested to hear about um, if people are from different areas, about sort of what are your challenges? What, what, what can we do to help improve quality of life, I think, is sort of the key here, is that I think that we often focus on the diagnosis and think, oh, what are we going to do about that? Oh, she's holding that one minute. I said I wouldn't even fill a minute. <laughs> Don't get me talking. Deborah's going to come up soon. She's a talker too. Um, and and so I think that uh, it's really important to to hear about how can we you know what we have parameters in government around what you can use your funding for and what you can't. But how can we better use that to improve quality of life? And what does quality of life mean for families so that we can help you reach that goal? Oh, I'd also like to thank you all for being here on a Friday night. I think uh, it shows huge dedication and commitment and interest to this topic area that you all are here with us. Um, my name is Tamara Kalusik. I'm a manager of policy and program development, and I work with Community Living BC, which is a crown agency that delivers supports and services to adults and adults and their families who have, meet our eligibility criteria. And I'll talk a little bit in a moment about the different eligibility criteria that we have. But I just wanted to spend a moment sharing a little bit about my own experience. Um, hearing Karen talk about doing workshops around the province and meeting with family groups and um, quite recently reminded me that early in my career, uh, one of the things that I had the opportunity to do was meet with family groups across the province during one of the first series of workshops that we did for families in this province. Uh, about 25 years ago and I entered the field I uh, often joke that I came in through the back door but my friends remind me that no indeed I came in through the front door as I entered as a parent first and foremost I have a 27 year old son who I've lived my life experience through and bring lots of that experience to the work that I do now um, and uh, my early work was with other families and I've continued throughout my career uh, connecting with and and being remarkably impressed at the importance of connecting with other families and I, I value that as a uh, ongoing theme in the work that I do now one of the things I always encourage parents as they're thinking about transition with their sons and daughters um, is to connect with other families wanted to take a moment just to tell you a little bit about um, CLBC and the range of supports that we provide and who we provide them to. One of the first things I wanted to do is let you know I brought a number of materials that are on the table out front. You can pick them up and pick up some copies of them on your way out if you like. One of the things that I brought was a piece of paper that outlines the roles and responsibilities of different organizations across government in relation to youth transition and youth transition planning. CLBC works in partnership with a number of other areas, Ministry of Child and Family Development, Health, um, etc. And we together worked on the development of this protocol that is intended to really look at person-centered planning which leads to better quality of life and good outcomes for people. And provide information to people about what they should be doing at what points in time to plan for adulthood. Um, I also brought information sheets about our specific eligibility and eligibility criteria because we do have very specific um, expectations for who we are able to serve and the information that I brought outlines that um, as well as information about planning and employment because really planning and thinking about life and all the good things that we like like employment and you know taking care of ourselves and and developing relationships are really important and we should be addressing those in planning and then I also brought an information sheet that outlines our um, role for engaging with families, working with families and youth in planning for transition for the future and it gives sort of a time frame to help people think about when we should be asking questions about CLBC and when we should be connecting with them to plan for the future if CLBC will have a role in planning with youth and their families. So I hand it over to you. Thank you. 
So my name is Joe Lucician, and I am a associate professor at the University of British Columbia. I'm in the Faculty of Education in the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology and Special Education. <laughs> it's very it's good for one. your lungs to say that. Um, so in regard to my perspective on family quality of life, um, for the past 20 years, I have been working as a behavioral researcher with families of children with autism and other developmental disabilities. Um, I or the folks I supervise have conducted over uh, have conducted 15 studies focused on what we call ecological family-centered positive behavior support. And we've conducted or I've, we've conducted or I've supervised the conduct of over 1,000 videotaped observations in family routines in the home and community. That could be a dinner routine, a going to a grocery store routine. We even have a, a research uh, group that I supervise who worked on a church routine, going to church. Um, and so within these studies, uh, we've provided training and support to I've provided training and support to or supervised training and support to 19 families of children with ASD in 39 routines. We also call these activity settings in the home and community. And in these studies, in some of these studies, we've, we've actually measured quality of life. And so in, in regard to the unique issues facing families of children with ASD, Sandra Harris is a very famous researcher in the area of uh, autism. You might know her name. And she once famously said, children with autism are tough on families. And I think that might be something people experience. Um, in some of my research, I, there, I found a study that actually looked at 100 families of children with ASD and wanted to know what's the level of parenting stress. And there's this index called the PSI. And the level, the, the, the common, the, the highest level of parenting stress for typically ra families raising typically developing kids is 252. Th that puts them in like the 75 percentile. But for families of kids with autism, it's 285, which puts them in a 92 percentile. So families of raising kids with autism on the average, if you take this as a sample, have more, experiencing more parenting stress than 92 percent of all families raising kids. So that gives you an idea of the challenge that families face. Um, another unique issue is that as you, of those of you who are families, um, the likelihood of significant problem behaviors is very high. Um, and what I study is coercive processes, the interactions between the parent and child that end up uh, inadvertently reinforcing ineffective parenting practices and problem behavior. And what we've learned to do is say, let's not work on just the behavior. Let's just work on the interaction. Let's build ecologies. Let's build activity settings in family life that will allow the family and the child to be successful to, to to create positive interactions, constructive interaction, and family routines that work. And when families do this, when families are able to create routines in the home that work, and in the community that work, what happens is problem behavior improves, child behavior improves, parent-child relationships improve, and the quality of life improve. That's what we found. Thank you. My name is Kathy Anthony, and I'm representing tonight, oh, here we go. I know I'm kind of loud on my own, but <laughs> um, I'm representing the uh, organization called the Family Support Institute. And that is a nonprofit provincial organization that was formed, is directed, and is driven by families with the model of families supporting families. So the Family Support Institute has over 200 volunteer, what we call resource parents, who are available to reach out and just be there um, as a connection to another family who may, may be wanting to seek another family's um, understanding about a particular issue or they're new to the community or they're looking for someone to uh, just make that connection with, someone who walks the journey. And the Family Support Institute, it's across all disabilities. So I, I was sort of hesitating and chuckling when Joe passed me the mic because um, when we talk about quality of life for families and a higher level of stress, well, look at the color of my hair. <laughs> I'm also a parent. I have two children, and my 29 or almost 29-year-old son, uh, Josh, requires support throughout life. But it was my teenage daughter that helped me to have white hair. <laughs> um, 
So I brought some material about the Family Support Institute. Um, we do workshops. We connect with families. We've made contact last year with over 10,000 different families through individual connection through the office and through workshops. We've also produced some books. Here's one book that was recently done in partnership with Community 11 BC, and it's called The Power of Knowing Each Other. And that's because I think one of the most important things when we look at quality of life and sort of stages of life um, is that at different stages and ages for families, we have different focuses of priority. So for early years, it's about intervention. You hit the school years, and it's about quality education and being connected in community. It's about your child's acceptance and belonging, but also your acceptance of fa as a family, because often you may not have that same experience as your neighbors or your brothers or sisters. In transitioning, it's looking about um, leaving high school, the adult year old, years. And as families, as we grow older, it's about who will be there for my son and daughter when I am gone. So the concerns move right forward past my lifetime into what happens in, in our, my son's future. Um, I think that I, it really excites me about quality of life because I read something many, many years ago, probably 20 years ago from Syracuse that looked at quality of life for families. And I thought often I think that as families we get so busy and trying to support the best we can of advocating and connecting and making sure everything's okay that what balance gets impacted is the scale of your full family life, of brothers and sisters, of your relationships, and of yourself as an individual human being, your own aspirations and goals. I think that there can be impacts around employment if it's looking for the flexibility for many of the appointments or the tasks that you may have, so financial impacts. But I think what families really can benefit the most from, and I know for me, I have lifelong friends that I met from the Family Support Institute over 25 years ago. We laugh together, we cry together, we celebrate together, we share, we're mentors to one another. You have guides that can lead you forward from a step ahead of you if they've already breached a certain area of life. So, again, to me, it's a what quality of life, but, but is it about is empowerment helping families to be empowered through knowledge, through connection, and through um, support and encouragement. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Deborah Pugh, and I'm the Executive Director of ACT, Autism Community Training, and quite a few of you I've met before, and those I haven't. It's, it's just wonderful to see this many families turning out on a Friday evening. I'd like to know actually how many parents are here and uh, so mostly parents. Way to go. Yeah. So any siblings? Great. And how about professionals and paraprofessionals? Uh, so it's a lovely mixed group. Um, ACT does about, um, in, in 2012 we trained just over 2,000 people. Uh, and provided what I call 22,000 hours of bums on seat training, which <laughs> my, my husband was in theater at one point, then we had a child with autism, so that went. <laughs> Got a job with the World life. Bank instead. <laughs> we needed it. But um, I guess for me, the interesting part of what I, when I hear of us all speaking down the table is just the um, agreement that there is around the importance of families uh, to uh, each other and to those who will be there for our children um, we hope throughout their lives and particularly siblings I think are underrated as an important source mm -hmm. of support um, for my my largest concern at ACT which provides information and support um, for families who have children with autism but anyone can call us I mean you don't we don't ask for the diagnosis before we provide information um, the biggest thing for us is actually that issue of empowerment and the the issue of families realizing that you know you're there for the long term for your child that it starts at a very young age and that it really is up to families in our current system to educate themselves and to advocate for their child and to really be involved because at the end of the day professionals come and go yeah. 
and you're you're there with your child, and things you know get get better. I know that my son now is um, 22. Um, as of last week, I had to hesitate a moment there. Um, and I remember when Joe came some years ago to talk to me about um, finding a um, finding some subjects for that big study you were doing. I listened to him, and I. My first response was, where were you 10 years ago when I really needed you? So this whole idea of positive behavior support, of you know, focusing on helping families deal with these issues in the home. Many of us are probably families who have older children. Um, and maybe this is something that you think is no longer possible or useful, or but I, I still think it's very important. It, it still helps me when, I, I, luckily I traveled with Joe all over the province. I think we did 10 events in, what, maybe 15 around BC. We flew into very small communities everywhere. And of course, I listened to Joe's talk again and again. So at any given time, I can hear Joe speaking behind me saying, in this situation, and it's very helpful, actually. <laughs> It's very helpful. Um, there has to be some perks. In my case, if you had a child with autism, I decided to find a job uh, related to this. And so that was really my message for tonight, is the importance of families becoming educated and working with your children because you're there for the long term. So I'm sat here <clears throat> sniggering, remembering when it was your son's birthday last year. <laughs> And we went to the cinema, and I was mortified that he not only wanted to eat his popcorn, but my sweets as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'm Tony Bailey. I'm a child psychiatrist at UBC. My academic work uh, revolves around autism spectrum disorders, but I'm also a clinician. I see children and adults across uh, the spectrum. I, I think it's great that you've organized this evening, Emily. I was looking at your slides, and um, the first one focuses on unique uh, issues. But to me, the issues are issues shared by all families. It's simply that some of them are brought into sharper focus if you have an individual on the spectrum in the uh, family. And my impression over the years has been that one of the imp things that impacts strongly on families' qualities of life is worry. Uh, worry isn't the same as stress. Worry is worrying what's going to happen to your child or your son uh, in particular situations. And I think one of the debilitating things about worry is it can go on for a very long time. So my experience has been diagnosing very young children that parents are already thinking what is going to happen when I'm no longer around uh, to take care of this child, which is something that if you have a more typically developing child, you, my daughter's traveling in Asia at the moment, so I worry about whether she'll eat too much chocolate cake, which is what she seems to be doing at the moment. Uh, but worrying about your offspring never goes away for any parent, no matter how old your children are, but it's not something that's in the mind of typically developing parents all of the time. I think also we tend to think of families in this, usually as sort of nuclear families where there are two parents, but the challenges of bringing up a child or adult with ASD by yourself are, are really quite extraordinary because you don't have that other person who, when you're really at the end of your tether, you can pass things over to. And I particularly agree uh, with the comments both of you were making about a protective factor being having supportive relatives and friends who you can go to and offload or they'll come over and take care of a child for a while and give you some free time because I, I think uh, any of you who are parents know that looking after an individual on the spectrum is sometimes a full-time job in addition to all the other full-time jobs you have and finding space for families to just do ordinary things as a family, particularly if you have a child who shows behavioural difficulties, I, I think can be very hard indeed. In terms of protective factors, 
I think the one I would draw attention to is the pleasure that comes from seeing your child or grown-up child achieve things. Uh, and sometimes you have to wait a long time uh, for people on the spectrum, but they always uh, surprise us. But I, the proudest I've ever seen families are when children have done things that they'd never anticipated they would do, or as adults they move into a job or they achieve a, a qualification or they form their own network of friends and establish really meaningful uh, relationships. And I think that uh, is a sort of priceless, positive contribution to families' qualities of life. Thanks. Now, I'm not sure how this arrangement works, because either this is a short cord, or you have a long neck, or there is, there is a, uh, a microphone over on the side for, to take questions. Um, I'll, I'll come along and have some extra sheets. I think I, I, I didn't mention, but I do have sheets in triplicate here for people that if there's a question or a concern or a point that you want to make that you just can't get done in a minute, please fill it out. It's in triplicate so you can remember what you wrote afterwards and it will come to the panel and either this evening or later on um, your point will be responded to and uh, hopefully addressed, but at least it will come to the attention of Emily and her team so that uh, they can uh, incorporate that in the, in the work that they're doing. So I think if uh, anyone who would like to raise questions and points, if we just come over to this microphone. <laughs> Should be in BC Place. <laughs> Well, let's, let's, you want, you want to write? Boy. Whoa. Now that, that's weird. Home was never like this. <laughs> okay, who would like to start with a question and a point that they would like to raise? One in the back. One in the back. All the way over there. Okay, here we go. Let's go out here. Let's switch our way through if that's okay. This is knee rubbing time. Um, hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, all the organizations that organized this talk and topic because um, the reason I'm here is because of the topic, looking into the future. And um, I'm trying to be as helpful as I can, you know, solution focused. Um, the first thing I'd like to share is that the future. This is what I cannot face. Because to me, the future is nowhere. Um, sorry, I always get emotional. Um, first of all, is the financial. I'm so sorry. I thought I couldn't. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Because raising a child with autism um, to To summarize, um, it, it is stressful, it is utterly overwhelming, and it's lonely. Um, and I remember there's a, a current survey um, from a master degree um, graduate, um, um, a student who um, is asking for a survey, and the first question she asked is that, what is the difference of raising a child with autism? compared to a typical child? Well, I wouldn't ask that question because of course there's the difference. You know, it's totally different. There is nothing that you need not, you, you don't have to, I'm going to say, sorry. There is, um, in every aspect, you need to teach a child with autism. Mm -hmm. There's almost not a skill that you don't have to teach him or her. But with, a typical, with families with typical children, they just grow up. They can learn anything on their own, even if you don't teach them. But to raise a child with autism, you can't. And first and foremost, the, the issues facing um, my family, at least, is financial. 
because without the um, <coughs> all the therapy, he can we 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 cannot survive. Um, yes, first and foremost, what is the government's good, good, um, helping families like us? How um, why is not why is not autism therapy included in Medicare? Because it is a neurological disorder. It's not. It is. It is a disorder. But why? Um, why aren't our therapy being um, included in the Medicare? And why would we have to pay ourselves? You know, un really into bankruptcy. What I can see now is that if ever my my other, my other my partner my 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 husband, um, I'm. I can't work because I have to take care of my child. Yeah. So with a single income family, um, <coughs> if his job is going to be stable, um, then maybe within the five years, we can still manage. But we can't see anywhere. So financially, what is the government um, helping us? How is he helping us? And Yes, and can I finish one more before? Yes. And the second is um, with social skills and everything and whatnot, is the school. Every family is facing, the biggest struggle they face is with the school mm -hmm. because they do not understand that children with autism are different. And um, research has been, you know, more and more um, upcoming now on how, you know, therapy is useful, but the school still say no. We know what we're dealing with. So it's a school issue. Yes, yes. We are fighting with you know financial and also the school. Thank you. Thank you. Would uh, Tamara or <coughs> Karen like to like to respond? Everyone's looking at me, so <laughs> it's okay. First of all, thank you for expressing that. I know that it, it's really hard, especially being the first person coming up and talking. So it's sort of breaking the ice and chatting about So thanks for that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk specifically, and I, and I won't get into, you know, I can put my full government hat on and tell you the that we provide $22,000 a year for children under the age of six and access to $6,000 a year for children over the age of six. In addition to that, $18,300 goes to um, the school system, and then the district decides what they're going to use those funds for uh, and how they're going to use those funds to support your child in, in the system. Um, uh, you know, and so there, there, is, there is some support. And, and what, what is, uh, what's been fantastic about British Columbia, and I, you know, I, uh, I, I know we have, a, we have a long way to go because right now we fund uh, all kids at the same level. You know, and to be quite honest, there are children under the age of six who don't access their full $22,000 a year because they don't need it. Right. I mean, it's, it's we're talking about a spectrum disorder. So we're talking about something where there's some high needs in one area and, and maybe not. And every kid is different. Right. So your needs uh, in terms of the, the, the skills you need to teach may be quite different than another family's needs. So, um, you know, so I, I think there's some thoughts that we have to do about how can we fund families and help support families to address the needs of their child in their family, in their home, in their community, because it's different, as I said, in your, this community than it is, say, up at Fort St. John. Um, uh, uh, so y you asked about um, Medicare, and I know that there is people asking about can it be in Medicare. Again, that's a, um, a, a federal issue. I don't want to sort of put it off to someone else. And I'm not an elected official, so, but that's a federal issue. But I, I think what's happened in British Columbia, too, we can really thank these families here, is that the reason that we have autism funding in this province is because of families. Mm -hmm. The reason we, uh, there is autism funding across this country is because of families. And it's because of the families in British Columbia. <laughs> um, so Ontario has families in BC to thank, so does Nova Scotia, so does, you know, so does many of the families across the states in terms of what you've done. So I think the power of families and things like this for people to get together and to um, work together. I think in the past, um, we've, it's been very controversial, very sort of, uh, not, I don't want to say controversial, but more, 
Adversarial, thank you. More adversarial, and, but I think that we're getting to the point where we're we're hand in hand, starting to work together to say how can we, you know, how can you tell us how we can make things better, and we'll try and find a way to do that, while taking care of the other fifty four thousand children in this province with other special needs. So, I mean, that's an issue that government faces often. Is that we have eight, we have about eighty five hundred children in this province right now with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Um, uh, but above and beyond that, we have another fifty plus thousand children with other developmental disabilities, and and kids with ASD are the only ones right now who get sir, who get funding above and beyond all the foundational services. So kids with ASD are really the only ones. There's some other programs uh, for de deaf and hard of hearing and other things, but in terms of exact funding, kids with ASD are the ones that are getting that now. So. Um, I, I think uh, I think it's having families come together, having families have a collective um, sort of goal in terms of what issue do we want to address now. Because sometimes we're hit in government with we want more money or we want this service or we want that, and government kind of goes, oh, which one do we pick? How do we do it? So. I think when we have a collaborative sort of event like this saying, how can we improve quality of life for families and how do we use, what should we fund and what shouldn't we fund, um, it is, will really be helpful. So I don't know if I answered and I don't know if I'm able to answer the question on uh, the money, but that's it. And in, in terms of schools, I, I would agree. I, I do hear from families across the province, not here is that uh, there are some school districts we have which are way better than others. Uh, even within school districts, um, I find that there's, it depends sometimes on the school, right, on the person. Um, I think most schools are doing as best as they can, um, but I think that we can offer um, more support to schools so that we can have those districts that are doing really well act as models for the ones that, that aren't. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Camera, but... Uh, or if we can go on. I, well, I, I mean, I, there were just a couple of things that I, I, I thought I would add um, in terms of the costs for supports. Um, in, uh, our system in adulthood is quite, quite different than our system for <coughs> child and family supports. Mm -hmm. And we also have very different models. Um, you were talking specifically about you know different kinds of intervention and therapy and those kinds of things, and we have very very different models in adulthood. I'm not going to get into a lot of the details of of that, but in adult services, when an adult has uh, significant support needs, those services um, tend to be directly delivered. However, families still often are making all sorts of contributions to their sons and daughters supports. And one of the most important things that families can do thinking about sort of the long term and ongoing uh, is thinking about the financial piece earlier because there are some opportunities that many families will know about but some will not have learned about things like registered disability savings plans where there's um, federal funds available that um, assist with long term planning uh, which can be you know, fabulous opportunities for planning into the future because families who do have adult sons and daughters are often, as we've heard, and as I know many of you are thinking about, you know, worrying into the future, what does that financial um, piece look like for our adult sons and daughters as well? And there are some uh, supports available in adulthood, for example, income support for individuals with disabilities and a range of things like that, but it's not always enough to meet everyone's needs, so it really is good to start thinking long term about that early on and look into things like registered disability savings plans, et cetera. Could I just, could I just say that perhaps after the meeting, the, the mother who just asked this question, perhaps after the meeting we could speak about other resources that, um, and just to have a longer conversation and maybe do some problem solving. In general, I think one of the big issues that I'm seeing for families is that a lot of families are doing therapy for many years, but there's not enough of focus on sort of those pivotal things that allow families to make progress with their child. So to take the pressure off the family was so important, you know, to be able to go grocery shopping is a lot of what Joe has been talking about, to teach the child to be more functional in the community rather than focusing on their letters or their numbers. And I'm not addressing the, this, this particular question, but as, a, as the parent of a 22-year-old who's kind of nervous because 
he's home alone tonight while I'm here and, you know, <laughs> will everything go well? Because I have all those anxieties. What did you call it? Worry? Did you call it worry? He calls it worry. <laughs> I call it anxiety. <laughs> um, but I do, and you know, when Adam was younger, I could not imagine ever having, that I would ever be able to leave him without having someone eyes trained on him at all times. So I guess what I would like to say is that things can improve amazingly. And sometimes when you see a child very young, you think there's just no hope. Um, and one thing, Tony, I'd like you to address is the fact that kids with autism, as they become adults, show more um, progress than we were led to believe when they were younger. Because I think that's such a positive message, which um, he told me several times. I found very, very useful. I seem to remember it was accompanied by wine. <laughs> yeah. That was useful too. Um, so I, I think historically, one of the one of the challenges for parents when you, you have a young child with autism who's non-compliant, non-verbal, not sleeping, is to put yourself in a space where things are different. Because I, I think one starting assumption, as in any relationship with any other human being, is that things will stay the same. And children with autism develop just as typically developing children uh, gain skills. But I think what struck many clinicians over the last five or ten years is that young people with autism continue to acquire very often significant uh, developmental abilities into their 20s, 30s and 40s, things that we have all accomplished by the time we're 17 or 18. I naively had always assumed that this was simply because people had more experience, more opportunities to practice things. But because of wearing my research hat, I've recently had to start thinking, well, that's a very sort of environmental view of things. And maybe what's happening in the person's brain is changing as they age. We're, we're used to as changing as we age. Uh, but I think many of us have never contemplated the fact that some of these gains in skills may be reflecting something changing in the brain of the individual as they mature. And I think particularly one can't overestimate um, the negative impact of anxiety on most people with ASD. And usually one sees big developmental gains as people become more relaxed in whatever is their environment. And somehow that seems to enable them to, to make significant advances. So I, I, I think to the lady who, who is clearly going through a very difficult time at the moment, I, I think the message from Deborah and I is it may be difficult at the moment, but it would be a mistake to assume it will always be like that. I'd just like to, I guess, maybe remind ourselves that this is not a Dr. Phil session and that all the problems will be answered right away because your problems are very complex and involve a whole multitude of people and agencies, organizations, and money. But the fact that they're presented, they're being, uh, they're being kept and, and taken into the research is really valuable. So for that, thank you for that. Okay, I'll try to be really quick here. Um, okay, I think I'm going to pick on Karen. Um, okay, I'd like to see the government uh, do a lot more interventions. Um, <clears throat> before the family disintegrates. Like, uh, possibly even, like, you get a diagnosis of autism and the family goes to counseling right away. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Almost mandatory, just to prepare them for what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. We have no idea. <laughs> okay. um, now, for the educational panel, I'd like to see you guys study uh, more outdoor education, uh, exercise, uh, yeah. correlation of uh, positive behavior supports, which is Joseph is awesome at, um, and uh, the possibility of removing medications. And the correlation of like just 
exercise and fresh air mm. as compared to just madam. No, madam, mm. that's no good, right? Um, possibly autism uh, specific schools and uh, just some encouragement for parents. Just take take ACT courses because they're awesome for inspiration. <laughs> um, roll with the autism and just have fun with it and just use humor. Thank you. Um, can I? Responses from anyone on the panel? I, I think they're really good points, and, and we've been trying to um, hear that. As I said, when we've done this sort of training that we did across the province, uh, families have been telling us, you know, where was this training when uh, my kid was first diagnosed? I think that's a really tough time for families. What we do right now, I will agree, is we say here's a diagnosis and, you know, we like the packages we give people. Everybody's got the red package and the things yeah. from ACT. But we say off you go. Go and, and, and go and sort of figure it out yourself. And I think we can do more to help support families make decisions and sort of move forward and, and know that they're not alone in that. So I'll, I'll bring that information back for sure. Um, in terms of the general rec, um, I, I, we are finding that is more and more in, important. And so um, as we move uh, into next September, we've made the announcement that we will be um, opening up, especially for kids ages 12, or, or ages uh, 12 to 18, sorry if I get it wrong, it's on TV and yeah, um, <laughs> is, uh, is, is that we will be, and, and for all age children, we will be opening up the ability to um, go into general rec activities with your autism funding because the studies do show that, that kids who are more integrated in general rec, not, you know, you can go to the special camp. You can go to the special, you know, swim lessons. You can go to the special, you know, sure, I, uh, that all that has its place. But, you know, you, you want, what the research shows is that if you are integrated into your community, you have better transitions to adulthood, yeah. less anxiety. You have better sort of your quality of life. Mm -hmm. It's actually it's quality of life measure. It increases. So we are, uh, we, we have recently uh, addressed that, and that will be something that will be changing in September. You'll be able to access that more easily. Yeah, and I'd like, I'd like to underscore that point because a lot of research in positive behavior support says this. If you want to improve a child's behavior, including children with autism or a youth with problem behavior or a, or a young adult with problem behavior, increase their quality of life. Get them active, find out the things they like, and provide support so they can do those things in the community. I supported in Oregon a young woman with extreme uh, self-injurious and, and, um, and aggressive <laughs> behavior. And what we did was we found the things she liked. And then we began providing her opportunities to do that with support, not just, well, let's do it. Let's figure out how to support her so that she can see, succeed with these activities she loved to do in the community. For example, going to a coffee shop and getting an orange soda or going hiking. And I, I remember going hiking with her in the foothills of the Cascades. And Ask me how many problem behaviors we saw when she knew she was going to Delbert's to get an orange soda or to um, this uh, sh small mountain in the foothills of the Cascades. Zero. Mm -hmm. And so the more we involve these inv individuals um, with good behavioral support in activities that they enjoy, that they want to do, that we've gleaned from their interests, the less we will see of problem behavior and also the less we will see stress in family life. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I have a really loud voice, so I don't think I need the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for being here. It's, um, it's really nice to be here. And thank you all the parents that are in this room. It's helpful as a student to have all these perspectives. My name is Ashley Nirmal, and I'm a doctoral student at the University of British Columbia. And I think when I look up at that screen, the middle point is so critical and it's consider quality of life at different development stages. And I think as a professional, it's so important to recognize what the needs are for families, whether infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. My research is looking at how to best support students in post-secondary education, educational settings, so students with high-function autism and masters. So my question to you all is, in your experience, what does family quality of life look like for young adults with HFA or Asperger's disorder um, from 
a family perspective, but also from the perspective of that individual who may be thinking about starting, not starting their own family, but having those thoughts of their own family. Kind of a big question, but I would appreciate, you know, kind of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, be, you've probably gathered by now that I'm not Canadian. And um, when I was back in England, we helped the disability office at the university I was attached to there set up a mentoring scheme for students uh, with ASD, which was, it was good for them, but it, it was also helpful for those of us involved in the scheme because it sort of gave us insight into um, what people's concerns were. And for very able uh, people, they quite like to leave their autism behind. Uh, they've got pretty fed up as being labelled as someone with autism, and a lot of them won't actually reveal to colleges or universities that they have a diagnosis because it's been the bane of their lives whilst they've been at school and they're sort of hoping they can go to university and if they don't tell anyone, no one will know they have uh, a problem. And for some people that works fine, they, they muddle through and for other people it's a complete disaster because as you transition into young adulthood and particularly into higher education, the level of support you receive is not the same as you were getting at school and when your parents were there to make sure you did the assignments, you went to school with all the relevant notes and things like that. It, it's a big uh, leap. So I think either moving into education or moving into the field of work is something that able young people desperately uh, want to do and I think is one of those things that sort of counts in my pride list. It, it's part of normal development for families that children leave the home and set up their own uh, families. And so facilitating that, I, I think, on the one hand requires paying attention to the special needs that arise because of the autism, but at the same time sort of trying to push the, the autism more into the background as people are, are going into adult life, because you don't want people feeling that autism is the sort of albatross around their neck. Uh, it's not. Uh, it may take longer for people to achieve the same things as typically developing individuals, but many people with autism uh, lead extremely fulfilling lives, and, and they need to be made aware of that. Watch me spill the water. I just wanted to make um, just a comment too, and I, I you know, I think um, we have some youth that we have a youth leadership council where I work that we've just formed. And when you ask the voice of youth, what do they see for their future? Of course, it's it's. I want to go to school. You know, I, I want a job. I want to make money. I want to have friends and have fun. I want a girlfriend. Um, I want to drive, maybe. You know, it's the things that are about having big dreams. And I think as for quality life, what families can be best supported with that those stages of transition through and into adulthood is, is to dream and to, to support your son or daughter to dream and to dream well and to dream big about possibilities and a good life or a great life, I'd like to say. <laughs> I think the other is on that other part of the spectrum. You know, as we look at a continuum, my son requires someone to support him in all aspects of life. But I still have big dreams, and I see him working, and I see him surrounded by relationships and people who love him. And I think what we need as families is that, again, the ability to feel hope and to instill hope in our sons and daughters, and to build resilience. Um, because for any of us, life is a valley and life has peaks. But to know that that's not related just to certain circumstances for people because they may have ASD. I think the other piece I think about is so often 
families are told, if you would just let go, you're going to have to let go. Right? Let go. <laughs> families know how hard that is, eh? To think of our fears, our worries, um, vulnerabilities, the things we do, all the what, what ifs. But I think that another way of supporting us as families is instead of the let go, because I tell you, my mom didn't let go of me yet, and I haven't let go of my daughter, who is 35. I call it supporting families to look at holding on differently. And the gift that our sons and daughters bring to society as human beings who are rich and wonderful and teachers and, you know, skilled individuals, no matter what part of the continuum they're on, their gift is to share with others. And if families, when we learn to hold on differently, we can share our sons and daughters much broader in other relationships. So, um, so, thank you. so in regard to families and what they might seek in terms of quality of life, uh, as their young, their child is now a young adult. And, um, I, I have been strongly influenced by the work of Ann Turnbull and Rudd Turnbull at the University of Kansas, and they've written a lot about this. And I've met them, and I've met their son, whose name is Jay. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things they emphasized, for, for, for as their understanding of what families seek, and again, there are families here who have a young adult, and so they they can see whether this fits with their own experience. But one thing is they really want their son or daughter to have a supported living arrangement that may not be in their home. Uh, maybe it's an apartment next to their home um, that they, they've developed. Um, and with really caring staff who not only are uh, paraprofessionals who support them, but maybe even develop a, a relationship that goes beyond professional, that, that there might be a friendship developed. And so that the relationship become can become longer term beyond just their term of employment because that's what the Turnbulls experienced and that was very positive for several decades of this young person's life and that's what other families have experienced. And so the, 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 the line between paraprofessional work and friendship, if it's loosely drawn or, 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 or not so hardly drawn, that actually can uh, increase the quality of life of this young person because now those <coughs> care providers now have become friends whether they're still working with them or not. And I've actually seen this in my own work in group homes where the care, care provider develops a relationship with the young individual with disability, the young per that goes beyond just I'm your uh, paraprofessional. The, the relationship becomes deeper because they're, they're doing things that are more personal in, in, within, within daily life or on the weekend or, or in the evening. And so that draws them toward a relationship that's different. And we shouldn't say that that's wrong. We should per per perhaps allow for that and see that, that as part of quality of life for these individuals. Another thing that Anne and Rudd taught me was, and, and I know from my own experience, is that families really do want some meaningful work for the young, even if it's part-time. And supportive employment is something that's very large in the United States and I think also occurring here in Canada. So they want a supported employment arrangement that's meaningful for the person, not just busy work, but real meaningful employment where they might get a paycheck. But the thing that they emphasized most to me, and I've seen this in my own experience, is they want a community of caring relationships throughout the immediate community that their young adult lives in. That isn't just the care providers in the, the supported living arrangement. That's the bus driver, mm -hmm. the cab driver, the person who runs the local grocery store that they go to or the restaurant that they love to go to or the coffee shop because it's that whole web of community relationships that know this person, know their name, have some relationship with them at that level helps lift them up throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year of their life um, in ways that one could not predict but can be very important. For example, this young individual became their son once at one point became disoriented in their community for some reason and was wandering around, lost. The cab driver who knew him went by, saw that he seemed disoriented, stopped, put him in the cab, and drove him home. That wouldn't have happened if those relations, relationships were there. So, so they emphasize building a community of caring that knows your son or daughter, and then you feel less stressed because you know we're not the only ones who are caring for and thinking about our son. The community around him is doing it as well. 
Thanks, Joe. I just have one thing, and I think you're really that important. really important mm -hmm. that safety net mm -hmm. in community. Say, and we you, people talked about general rec and things like that. And what I hear, heard from families in one community was, you know, my kid didn't play on the hockey team, but he helped out with the hockey team, and it actually saved him from some being beat up one day on the street because he was walking along, and other kids were bugging him, and other kids from the hockey team were walking, happened to walk by, see what was going on, and said, hey, you know, what are you doing? Like, stop bugging this kid. Off, you know, off you go. So it, it, that community of care creates a safety net for people as well. That's exactly right. uh, What I wanted to comment on yours, I think just going back to that a bit, um, I think in the university setting, uh, if we're talking about Asperger's or high functioning or whatever, you know, we want to, whatever we want to label it, um, the thing that we see a lot after, a lot of people will do quite well in that university setting. Um, a job is 80% social and 20% the actual what you're doing. And a lot of people and adults are telling us, I'm losing my job because I don't do well at meetings. I don't do well in the lunchroom. I don't do well, I, I don't do that social part of the job as much. When you think about how much social stuff has to go on in your job. So I think at the university level, we could do a better job of, of really talking about what it's like to have a job. It's not just doing that task. It's not just sort of doing good work. It's more of that. And I, I think that that is what will maintain a quality of life for a person in the longer term because those they're knowing how to not just get that PhD, which they some people, many people with autism have PhDs or masters or whatever it is. It's not just getting that uh, or that specific skill. It's using that within a work environment, which is quite different than a university environment. Yeah, and I'd, I'd yeah. like to support that because uh, don't <laughs> wag your finger at me, Grace. <laughs> Did you try to get it? Um, <laughs> I, I, I've, one of the challenges uh, with universities and colleges in general is that uh, they're used to dealing with typically developing people. Uh, and as our first speaker pointed out, you don't have to teach typically developing people how to decide what you want to do for a job or how to go about looking for one or how to dress for an interview or present yourself in an interview. These, these are all tasks that need to be taken seriously. And universities have trouble seeing it as part of their job. And even disability offices at universities have trouble seeing it as part of their job. So I always emphasize, if someone's going to university, that I want the university careers officer to be talking about jobs to that student in their first year at university, not when they're in their final year. Because these are big issues. People spend most of their lives as adults, not as kids. And we've put far too much emphasis on support during childhood and not at enough emphasis on helping people make a transition, a successful transition into adult life and, and supporting people through the many different stages of adult life. Adulthood is just as complicated as childhood. Okay, I just want to quickly <laughs> get in here, um, my two cents. Uh, it touches on a lot of what the panelists have already said um, in terms of dreaming big, in terms of, um, you know, the university setting or college setting, uh, adulthood and so on. Sometimes uh, I think, it, you know, professionals, parents, um, people uh, tend to, to see a person with ASD and then kind of put them in this box, right? They can only do this, or they can only do that. Um, I remember one family when I suggested to them that their their son go to college, uh, and he was a lower functioning individual cognitively, and they looked at me with shock. <laughs> uh, and there are different reasons why you might want uh, a child in college. It's not always to get uh, necessarily you know, a degree or a bachelor degree. Colleges, universities are actually quite safe places uh, for individuals um, with ASD. And at SFU, we're, we're just uh, starting to plan now. Hopefully by the fall, we'll have a peer mentoring program off the ground. Um, we, our disabilities office is just 
amazing in terms of what they are, are willing to do um, and, and the planning around helping uh, individuals with ASD. Um, the other program that we have at SFU that is, uh, might be of interest to people is that you know, you, the, 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 the individual does not necessarily have to enroll as a full-time or part-time student, but could take courses, and this means individuals who are lower functioning may be able, and we do have, um, um, it, it depends specific on the specific case, but lower functioning individuals can get in and do specific courses or be in that environment and take part in that environment um, for different reasons, different goals. So sometimes um, I, just, I just want families to think about a, a little bit outside the box sometimes in terms of you know, their child and the goals, uh, future goals, and, and, and why they might want to uh, opt for maybe further education, not necessarily to get a diploma um, if, if, if that's the, the case. Tamara, are you ready to? Yeah, I just I just wanted to follow up a little bit with one of the things Grace was saying. Um, at, at CLBC, uh, I said before, we have sort of two different areas of eligibility. So one, the, one of the major groups of adults that we serve are adults who have an intellectual disability. And as we know, um, some people with autism spectrum disorders will also have an accompanying intellectual disability. Um, we also have a, an alternative eligibility stream for adults who have either a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder or a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder together with significant limitations in adaptive functioning. And, and among the people that we are serving, we do actually have one area um, where we... It's a, sorry, it's not an area, but we have one service provider who does support adults who have significant limitations, so they're not going to get into university programs um, on an academic stream, but it, it is inclusive post-secondary, and we've had huge successes with that. And um, like any of the other things, you know, Karen was commenting on earlier how we have the kind of autism service in this province that we do because of parents, um, Steps Forward is the organization that provides inclusive post-secondary support for adults. And again, it was parents who came together um, because their sons and daughters were interested in these kinds of opportunities. And those parents have just been incredible at working together with government to get funding to support their sons and daughters to have enriched programs in universities like their peers because many of them are leaving high school and wanting those kinds of things. So just wanted to comment on that and also wanted to comment on in relation to employment, I think Tony, your, your point around looking at employment earlier, so in the first year of university, one, one of the things that's true for most people, actually I'll ask, how many of you had your first job after you graduated from high school? How many of you had your first job before you graduated from high school? Yeah. How many of you had your yeah. first job in elementary school? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, so and, people 12 years old, they, I might oh, yeah. 10, they have a paper. And, know, and it, quite often, once we get into planning for our family members, our sons and daughters with, with special needs, we often don't look at some of those other things that we are looking at for our other kids, or, or, <coughs> or we can't figure out how to do it without additional supports. So I just really want to encourage people to think about that in the same way as you're thinking about it and watching your sons and daughters peers experience those kinds of things because we, we also know that for adults, including adults with developmental disabilities, um, one of the best indicators of them having employment opportunities later is to start in employment earlier. So it's really important for us to be planful and thoughtful about that. Thank you. I think we'll move on to another question. I'm just wondering how we help teenagers specifically uh, my son is 15. He has Asperger's and Tourette's and ODD and something else. He's, he's got more letters after his name than I do, and he's only 15. Um, when there's a reality gap, sorry, I have to look at my notes here. When there's a reality gap in terms of what we as parents know to be true about something, but what he feels is true about something, 
he reacts on what he feels, and he believes that what he feels is correct. And so, you know, how do we reach these children when the parents can't? Where can we support them in school um, if there's resistance to counseling because they believe it won't work? How do we reach these children to encourage them or bring them alongside to um, uh, teach them that they actually need help if they're resistant to believing it? Because when it comes to family quality of life, uh, we have huge issues um, when it comes to parenting, and they're just normal, simple, like, please empty the dishwasher. Well, that could just destroy dinner. Um, it's, it's really amazing. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues, but I think there's quality of life for my wife and I, my daughter, but there's also quality of life for my son. He believes certain things, so how do we improve his quality of life? He believes he has a miserable life. He actually believes it, and he believes the parents are the cause. Um, he's got a wonderful life. He longboards all the time. He's on the computer researching longboards. He doesn't do the dishes. He actually has a tremendous life um, from an outsider's life. point of view because <laughs> he's got no responsibilities. But he believes during these times when he gets so upset at us that, you know, and they'll, they'll talk about, well, you know, I'd rather not be living because my life is so bad. Well, it's actually not that bad. So how do we help these children, which in turn would help our quality of life in the family? Sounds like my family. <laughs> well, I, I think that's the uh, crucial issue. So uh, I started my remarks by drawing attention to the fact that the issues facing families with young people on the autistic spectrum are actually not always unique to that particular situation. And one of the, one of the challenges I sometimes face as a clinician is helping families sort out what is autism and what's normal childhood. Uh, what's if, <laughs> yes, because if the only child you have or your eldest child happens to have autism, how are you to know whether behavior X is because they have autism or because... They're 15. Thank you. <laughs> and um, part of the challenge in dealing, especially with people at the more able end of the spectrum, um, is getting them to change their point of view. It's hard getting anyone. Uh, to change their point of view. But people with ASD uh, can take much longer uh, to change their minds about things than other people. And part of normal family life and part of growing up is failing. And one of the traps that we fall into as professionals and, of course, as parents uh, is we want to prevent our patients or our own children from failing. But if you talk to any successful uh, person or any successful businessman, they always tell you why they got to be so good was not because they got everything right, it's because they failed. And sometimes the only way for someone with ASD to realize that their point of view may not be right is to let them realize that actually if they persist with it, they don't achieve what it is they want to achieve. That may sound harsh, but actually it's the reality of life. And we don't help people become responsible adults and participate in society if we're too protective of them. Uh, and so my short answer is actually you may not be able to convince him uh, the longboarding isn't the way uh, to a successful uh, career. Um, he may have to slowly learn that for himself. And like all young people, he may take mo more notice of his peers than he does of his parents. So what often happens is that as young people with ASD see that their peers are behaving differently and making developmental gains, often that's a, a bigger incentive for them than anything parents or professionals may say to them. Why would he not be able to do longboarding if he really loves that? 
I have no trouble with him doing longboarding. In fact, my house seems to be full of longboards at the moment. It's simply that uh, rather like there aren't many openings for being a pop star or an astronaut or many other esoteric jobs that I've had uh, young people suggest they want to be, uh, there are many things that we enjoy in life that we have to keep as hobbies but may not be uh, a route to earning money. Yeah. I, I had a very interesting call this week from a friend of mine who's a speech-language pathologist asking me about supported employment um, coaches for a young man I saw um, at a... Uh, a panel discussion at SFU some years ago who was really vociferous about his mother to the point where I, I kind of had to leave the room because I know his mom is a very sweet person and but he was very angry and he was a teenager who felt that she was causing all the problems that he was facing very able young man also with some mental health issues well recently from he's now living in a group home and he knows that as the age of 19, he's not going to get funding because his IQ is well over 70. And he's smart enough to have figured this out. And he knows that he needs to get a job because he doesn't want to be on the downtown east side like some other people he knows. So I thought this was really interesting. He's seeing, he's, you know, he's smart enough to see that he needs a job because that's not what he doesn't want. So often, um, I wouldn't have expected he would have got there when I saw him at the age of maybe 15 or 16, that these things would have started to fall in place with him. So there, you know, now work is being done to get him an employment coach, and I have no doubt that he'll actually be able to find and hold down a job because he's really motivated. And I just say this because at 15, uh, it's really very difficult to to believe that anything will change. But I agree with Tony. You have to. They have to. Act. We all have to experience failure and to see that our own, you know, that often with with my own son, who certainly doesn't have high functioning autism, he will repeat things to me again and again in the hopes that I will agree with him and somehow this will be true, right? <laughs> and so, you know. That doesn't work, right? So my, my attitude would be, well, you know, you don't have to do the, you don't want to unload the dishwasher. You know what? I don't want to cook dinner. I'll unload the dishwasher. <laughs> so, you know, really it's, we're all members of a team. And actually I think it's harder with young people who have, who have Asperger's or high-functioning autism than it is with kids who are more impacted. So I'm not saying that this, it's not as easy as I'm making it sound. That's the technique I use for my son. He's very fixated on his stomach, so it's highly effective. <laughs> but, you know, you have to be able to say, if, but if he wasn't interested in food, it wouldn't work. But you have to look for the motivation, right? So, but I was really impressed with having seen this young man change over three years, that he's now looking for a job coach. He realizes he's going to need to get a job. These are things that that I would not have predicted were possible. Mm -hmm. Other points? Is that a response to the, is another question or response to that? Okay. I'm doing a sequence. So this young, uh, young? Hmm. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate Who are you it. talking to? <laughs> Actually, um, I thought my question was way out in left field until the last question. And that is, recently, we have started using medication with our son. And uh, it's something that we are very uncomfortable with. We know that there are some aspects of my son's thinking processes that need to be altered or at least may giving them more time to actually consider what a problem actually is before giving up uh, or before saying, I know what the answer is. Um, but. Well, the problem that we're having is, how do we know that we are monitoring our son's medication properly? And how do we uh, keep in touch adequately with the medical profession to make certain that we are keeping on top of it? Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. How old is he? He's 11. <laughs> Dr. Bailey. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> Medical doctor. <maybe>. Stop it. <laughs> So the first point I think to make is that medication <laughs> isn't the mainstay of managing yeah. anybody with autism. Uh, the sort of rule for doctors is medicine is the last resort uh, when behavioral approaches haven't worked. And there is no medication yet available that actually treats the symptoms of autism. All we have medication for are dealing with common, what we call comorbidities, things like overactivity, anxiety, depression, the, the sort of very common problems that affect individuals. So um, one of the earlier questioners, I, I think, mentioned something about getting somebody off uh, medication and I actually spend more time taking people off medication than I do putting them on it and so I think you're right uh, to be concerned about getting medication right because there can be times when it, it's needed uh, either because people have become too worried uh, about things or too obsessional or particularly in teenage life start to get miserable uh, where, when things don't seem to be going as well as they should be. The reality is the, the, re the real responsibility for monitoring the medication and uh, assessing whether the dose is right lies with the person prescribing it. Uh, it's not your responsibility to do that. I, I think where you make the significant contribution is to give the information to the person prescribing about how your child is doing on that particular dose. You can give the objective account that the affected individual may find hard themselves. Uh, and I think if you're not, if your belief is you're not seeing the medical professional often enough, then make a real pain of yourself um, and, and persist uh, until they see you on a regular basis. But, but the, the responsibility for deciding dose is very definitely not that of the family. Your, your job is to report so that the professional can form a, an informed judgment about how things are going. Thank you. First of all, I'd also like to thank you all for coming today. I'm sorry, I came a little late, so I may have missed some of the stuff. My personal case is my son is transitioning right now from Children's to UBC. Um, and what we're finding is the better he does, the more you take away. He needs cognitive therapy. It's true. The better he does, the more you take away. He's 19, at 19 when he's doing all his transitioning and he's got to change, all the funding's gone, there's nobody to help him fill out the paperwork. He has a ton of paperwork. I'm not good at paperwork either. There's nobody. We've been to community living, we've been to Laurel, we've been UBC, we've been everywhere. There is nobody that is going to help him unless we take some money out of our pocket and pay a psychologist to help him. So the better he does, the more you take away. He needs things like, and I know even from childhood, stuff that they needed wasn't available. We had autism funding, but we couldn't find anybody to teach him the, the therapies that he needed, the social skills, the um, cognitive, the positive behavior thoughts, these things that he really needed then and still needs very much now, we'd love to get our hands on, it's not available. I'd do the phone calls, six calls in a row. You'd say, go to them, they'd say, go to them, they'd say, go to them, they'd say, go to them. I'd go around that circle six times, I'd be in tears. It's not available. So what I'm asking is, put your heads together and find a way to get those things that we need, the actual things. It's nice to keep giving us money, it's great. I had to give most of it back at the end of each year because I would write advertisements into the SFU and, uh, and um, Quatlin and stuff to the, the psych students asking, is there anybody who will just Take my kid to the gym, work out with him, and teach him social skills. Teach him that you don't stare at the girl's breasts on the, the thing. Just teach him those very, very simple things. We put ads in. We gave our money back because we couldn't get it. 
So that's what we need. That's what I say we need. That would make my life better, our whole family's life better. That's, that's what I'm asking from you guys. Yeah. I think that um, it, thanks for sharing that and um, I think you're right I think about 10 years ago in this province when we started our autism funding um, there wasn't much on the shelf to buy for young kids um, we've done a lot over the past year not we being government we as a autism community have done a lot to uh, increase service capacity but that service capacity has had a lot of focus on kids under the age of six um, and I and I think that where a gap is, a, a sort of a chasm, perhaps, is the services for kids over 12, over 13, 14, 15. You know, and and sure, you know, going to a speech path once a week for you know a 14 year old who doesn't really have an issue with you know maybe their language or speech or tick, it's it's sort of a not a appropriate use of funding. So I I wonder if um, there is isn't there a talk that's coming up at no, we are looking at. Um, I'm looking over because there was a handout that was going oh, around. The the adults preparing for adulthood. Preparing for adulthood, um, and and it is starting. They're starting to look at sort of how can we and, and I and I think so. What I'm saying is I agree, but I think we need to as families. It would be good to know from you uh, is things like you know like vocational training. What what do we mean by that, and sort of what does that look like? Because it's a it's a cross between figuring out what is qual that what does that look like in a, in a quality way versus uh, you know I have families who think their kids going to a vocational training thing but actually it's a service provider who calls himself a behavior consultant who takes six kids out to Tim Hortons charges 100 bucks each per kid for an hour and he makes his pay for the you know month you know so it's figuring out what that can look like and how can we get some quality around that so I'm not I'm not sure I have the answer for you but I'm saying that we've come a long way in BC in terms of that we've, we've come a long way in terms of the the services for young kids it's the kids kids get older surprise right it's it's figuring out what to do for those but uh, I'll let other people chat on solutions that they may have um, I very much share your concern because at ACT we get a lot of complaints from families that I think are totally justified about services that are irrelevant and not productive or that families can't find um, service providers. And we have, it's, it's actually, I think as a, as a society we have to start really understanding what it is that we need to teach and, and maybe it isn't just young people with autism. If you look at the whole issue of kids never leaving home, you know, the <laughs> many of us who have children with special needs who think they may never leave home also may have a couple of others in the nest who don't appear to be leaving home either, you know. So I think that there are some things about independence that we need to teach. and But we need to be thinking about this collectively. So I would agree with Karen that if you could write down some of those things, not and it's not because it's not just you who is experiencing it but what it is is that people get so frustrated they get very angry they don't actually communicate what it is that in their community would make a difference and i find it quite interesting how when people write things down and discuss them get together and, and collaborate that often professionals and paraprofessionals will respond i think where we personally where we're seeing a huge um, what we're talking around here is the role of schools because we do have, you know, kids are, edu are in the education system until at least grade 12, and many children with special needs, because they haven't finished their IEPs, should actually be staying longer. There should be specialized education within the school systems that, allow, that actually pinpoint these issues to allow young people to be prepared for, for the real world. I don't think it's happening. Um, I've, I keep my ear fairly close to the ground, and I don't think that that is happening. It's not a responsibility that the school districts have taken upon themselves. Um, and parents have a very hard time exerting any pressure on school districts. They are not accountable to, to families. Um, so I think that it's a, it's a huge 
a lot of money is being spent, and that's where the children are until they finish grade 12 at least. So I would like to see more emphasis put on standards of, of expectations around school systems uh, for training and, and basic you know, functional skills, particularly around pre-employment. But Tony had something to speak to on, in terms of this talk that's going to be happening, or this day. So um, Karen was referring to the um, handout alerting people to the fact there's going to be an open meeting on Saturday, June the 21st. And uh, the background to this is that the issue of finding work for people on the autistic spectrum has sort of bubbled up the top of the political agenda over the last three or four years in most developed countries, actually, not just in Canada. I think in part because of this large cohort of uh, individuals who've been diagnosed in the last 10 or 15 years, people have suddenly woken up to the fact that most of these individuals are going to want jobs uh, when they reach adult life, and that as a society, uh, the school system hasn't prepared them for that. Uh, colleges and universities haven't seen the need to provide additional training to enable people to get jobs, and there hasn't been a push uh, to alert employers to the skills that individuals with ASD could bring to them and to get them to even consider offering somebody who was in some way different uh, the chance of paid employment. There was a conference held last year in Toronto, the first in Canada about uh, vocational opportunities for people with autism, and a group of us uh, have sort of remained interested in the issue since. And because all service developments in every country have always been driven by parental pressure, it seemed to us that the best way to get something going in uh, British Columbia was to hold an open uh, meeting to hear people's views and ideas and, and to try and get some impetus uh, behind this. Because I think everyone on this panel hears from parents or affected individuals themselves about their longing to have a job and the difficulty of achieving that. And it, it's really time that something was done about it. So uh, there are plenty of these leaflets, but please pass on uh, to people who can't be here this evening. This is an opportunity for people to come and air their views and uh, collectively try and make something happen. Thank you. We'll move on. Hi there. I wanted to thank everybody on the panel as well for coming. Uh, my name is Jody. I'm a mom of a seven-year-old boy that lives with autism. And I think that I just wanted to uh, discuss two things in regards to quality of life that I think would be quite beneficial and essential for your study. And the first is that, and it kind of goes along with some things that were discussed, that family quality of life is directly correlated with the quality of services that are provided. Uh, in our particular family, my son received services from an agency uh, before he turned six and $22,000 a year. And I later on, through education and advocacy, realized that the quality of those services were very poor. Um, you know, I changed things up. I got an amazing behavior analyst who's done wonderful things for our family. And after six, we have far much less money but our quality of life has skyrocketed because we've had um, just a great thing going. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, even if families and parents do everything that's discussed here, you know, I went back to university and I'm a behavior interventionist and I've worked for different service providers and, and our home life has greatly improved. And I, and I can say that I can definitely see the dreams in my child's future and we have a lot of very positive things in our home and we worked really hard for that. The problem is, is that I have to leave my son for five hours of the day and the family quality of life that we receive now that he's in school can be very poor at times because I have to spend a great amount of energy advocating and fighting and you know all these 
crazy things. So I think that if part of your study has something to do with how there's a correlation between those two things, maybe it will empower us as parents to take some of that information to go to the government and school boards to say, look, it's proven. When the schools don't support families and they don't you know, have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Across environments. Consistency across environments. It hurts not only the children, but it hurts the family as a whole. I would really like to spend my time at night uh, having quality activities done with my children instead of on the internet looking at the Ministry of Education's policies and mm. and you know researching numbers and advocating with my school board and and all those kinds of things so that's what I think we do have a great new video on this very topic that will be out that's actually available on the website so let's talk about that just to, to at least make it faster you know to speed things up you just one of the things i think our families are are probably having most difficulty with right now is is the school system i mean that's what at act we are hearing long diagnostic waiting lists is one thing but often families aren't contacting us because they they don't know that they have a child with autism so they're not contacting ACT but we know that there's you know certain barriers along as the diagnostic waiting list and then it is difficulties in the school system and it's 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 profound and it's pervasive um, and I think that families are are getting increasingly frustrated and I'm hearing the same stories that that replicate what I experienced with my own son I don't know, 16 or 17 years ago, which I find that's unacceptable. Um, I, I want to just comment quickly on the quality of service. I think that you sort of hit the nail on the head there. Um, uh, uh, autism funding started very quickly in this province. It sort of got developed very quickly. Um, and at the beginning, I said there wasn't a lot on the shelf to buy, so people were purchasing services from, you know, people that kind of had experience but maybe not um, we've w tried to work really hard to the ministry along with other experts to develop the registry of autism service providers list for kids under the age of six to provide some quality assurance for families but that still has a ways to go because you can go on to the RASP and you can get a service provider and it it might not be good so we have been uh, thinking about that a lot we've just developed a new complaints process it isn't sort of formalized yet but it's a process which will allow families to um, complain about service provision and it will give us the legal opportunity to remove people from the RASP who don't provide the, the type of service that they, are, that, that they say that they're qualified for. Um, because really what the RASP is, is giving you sort of a list of people that we say you should go to these people. They know what they're talking about. They're going to help you and you get into something and if you don't know any better if you don't know what good looks like like you said you end up two years down the road and you're hitting yourself thinking it's my fault i should have looked at it before and it's but it's not it, it's i think it's a, a system as well so we are looking at guidelines of service provision so that families can better understand what that looks like we're, we're talking a lot about um, uh, helping families to ask the right questions and not just giving a lot of times they say you should ask all these questions to your service provider but they don't tell you what your answer should be so you have all these questions and they're like so what's your degree and they say oh it's in blah blah and you're like okay I asked that question you know I, okay um, and but I think we can do a better job of, of empowering I think people are talking about empowering families to know that oh this this doesn't look right you know we've been doing this goal now for a year and a half and we're still working on it and it hasn't you know maybe we need to adjust it maybe we need some good people in your life because I do agree quality service I would much rather have a family spend all their funding on two hours of really good quality service if it's over six or you know, tw 10 hours of quality service than 20 or 30 hours of respite right yeah. So, 
you know, I, I think that it, it is an issue. So we're trying to really provide some, while still giving families choice. We, we, in British Columbia, that's a big thing. Families have, every kid's different, right? But we still need to, people tell us all the time, why can't I as a new service provider get on the RASP? Well, if you don't have the set, the, the foundational qualifications, we're not going to make get you there because currently this province doesn't have a regulatory body for behavior consultants. N not, not n hardly any provinces have regulatory bodies because behavioral consultants or behavior analysts is pretty much sort of a new profession, mm -hmm. right? It's a very it's a very new profession. So I think that um, we've been learning a lot through that. But you know anything to, and there is a complaint. If you have a, a, a issue about your service provider or the service provision, families can go to ACT, and there is a process, a current process. In, in the way and do a formal complaint. If we don't know about a service provider, if we don't know that you were charged $1,000 an hour for something, you know, because we get those invoices, but if we don't know that, you know, you're being sort of either overbilled or someone's sort of a bit of a snake oil, then we can't, we can't address it. So we love it when you call us, a funding unit or act, and say, this is what's going on, C can we look into it? Because that gives us the ability to identify folks who are, you know, I'm not saying there's a lot of great service providers out there, but there's ones that probably shouldn't be in this field. So it's a, that's, it's a topic close to my heart. Now, Karen's just been on holiday, so she hasn't read the new contract that says that we're now moving over to the ministry uh, administered complaints process and ACT isn't taking any more formal They aren't taking any money right now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but call us. But call the funding still, unit. Let us we know. We still want to hear, and we, we can still do it. a lot for families yeah. to, to say, okay, this is where you need to go to, to resolve this, or we will, you know, help you. Um, take a complaint to one of the colleges if it's a college uh, involved to better to the Better Business Bureau to the Autism Funding Unit, or at least to say yes, you have you know you have grounds to be concerned. And I think it's really important for many w when when Joe and I were crossing the province, it was the issue of he taught me this concept of of connoisseurship because we used to sort of you know be worried about we do this two day workshop on positive behavior support. And then we'd leave, you know, what did that really leave families with? And what we tried to leave them with was a sense of connoisseurship, that you should at least know what this should look like when it's going well, right? Mm -hmm. And if families haven't got, if, if you stay at home and wait for the professional to come to you, and that's the only source of information you have, that you're not reading, you're not participating in workshops, you're not going out and meeting people in parents' groups, you're just waiting for the the godlike professional to come upon you and, and you know, tell you what the way it should be. You are, to my in my perspective, you're very vulnerable to not being able to make informed decisions, not to be a member of the team, because you haven't educated yourself to understand what it is that the professional's talking about. And in this particular field, it's very overwhelming. So um, what Karen's saying is true, that there are many wonderful professionals in BC, but there are some that, that families are finding quite frustrating to work with. Before, I, I realize there's some other questions too, but I wanted to address the one thing that I think still uh, might benefit from being addressed, and that is the relationships you've had with schools. Um, I, so I just want to make four or five comments, and mostly it's um, underscoring and validating the points you've made, but also adding a caution here as we think about schools. I'm a teacher. I'm not, uh, I'm not a psychologist. My whole career before working here has been as a teacher of students with moderate, severe, and profound disabilities, including autism. Homeschool collaboration is essential, absolutely essential. In fact, uh, a paper written in the United States says that the huge secret is that homeschool collaboration makes a huge and positive difference, and nobody seems to know it. And so, um, if you if you uh, Google Sandra Christensen, homeschool connections, and you buy this book, you'll you'll receive an amazing gold mine of information on how to promote homeschool collaboration. Sandra Christensen is a school psychologist. There's some school psychologists here, and they have done amazing work at promoting homeschool collaboration. And reading that literature could be incredibly helpful and perhaps empowering. But the other thing is, what has to happen, and whoever here has some ability to move things in this way and leverage this, 
schools, teachers, principals need to see parents as partners, not as clients, not as uh, one down, easy, easy to be ignored. Um, when a family rages at a school, it's not because they're dysfunctional, it's because they're not receiving, they're perceiving their needs aren't being met. They're actually showing love, love for their child that's fierce. And if we understand that, we will be able to go, oh, what is your need? How can I better meet it? And all of a sudden, all that fero fer ferociousness can turn within a matter of days or, or moments into tremendous support to the school and, and tremendous alliances. And educators need to understand that. And if anything we can do, all of us, to help create that understanding that when families are treated as partners, wonderful things can happen. Your job becomes so much easier, and not to mention that, great cookies are delivered to your classroom. <laughs> Not to mention the upside down cake that, that Mrs. Kittleson <laughs> sent to my classroom, which I'll never forget. Um, and the other thing is you should know that the BC Ministry of Education is 100% behind educators and administrators collaborating with families. They created a, a lovely booklet, which is available from the ministry, I think, for free, on homeschool collaboration, how, how to approach it as a parent, what the teachers and schools' responsibilities are, what some of the legal aspects are, as the, U as the uh, BC Supreme Court have recently um, uh, put in their voice on the importance of collaboration, the importance of accommodating kids with disability, which some schools seem to still not quite understand. Um, and, but there is a caution here. One under has to understand that the school is a culture, a culture that's over 100 years old. I like to say designed by a bunch of... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, Scottish men from the eight, 19th century, uh, and that's still there's a legacy there of it being hier hierarchical and paternalistic and authoritarian. But if you understand the culture, you'll under you'll better understand ways of entry because there I have under there are behavior analysts who have gone into a classroom, walked away, and badmouthed the teacher left and right. And I'm not sure that's the best way to, for school entry. And I know other behavior analysts who make a beeline to the principal's office first thing and say, I'm here to be a support, and I really want it to work. And if anything I do that harms anyone, let me know, and I'll stop, and I'll apologize and ask forgive, forgiveness. And they are entered, they're allowed entry, and things go really well. So if you don't have good entry skills and understand the culture, one has to understand it's a two-way street so that both parties have a role to play in making it work. So that's what I wanted to say. I have a lady in the back. Is there something in the front? If you don't mind, I'll just do a quick, a quick thing. Mine's not a question per se. It's more um, my family's perspective on the family quality of life. Um, I'm a single parent. My marriage dissolved um, for two reasons. A, my ex-husband couldn't accept the fact that our son was diagnosed with autism and he um, was abusive. So it took um, watching my son suffer uh, for me to decide to leave. Um, our quality of life now is mostly affected um, by me trying to balance working full time and being a parent. I leave the house at 20 to 8, quarter to 8 every morning after I put him on the bus and I get home at 6 or 6.30. So, and then it's dinner and trying to decipher his day and God forbid we have to stop at the grocery store as witnessed in Safeway last evening. Um, I've had people offer to hold my bags so I could smack him. Um, it's, um, and I'm from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia and we don't take those things well. Um, in fact, <laughs> referring to something Dr. Bailey said earlier about what's normal, what's ASD and what's just a child, for five years the school talked to me about my son's volume level and how we needed to control it. And I told them if they found a solution to that, I have an entire family that would benefit from that. <laughs> um, good luck was basically every time they called me in for a meeting, that was what I said was good luck. I, you know, I wish you the best. Um, now is I've, I've lost a job because they were not able to accommodate me. Um, seeing the psychiatrist, I mean, it's all during work hours. So I now don't have a lot of support. I live here in BC alone. My family is in the east. Um, but moving my son at the age of 12, I believe would be detrimental. And I feel BC is home for me. Um, 
so it, it proves to be the biggest challenge is the balance of life and work and support. This is the first kind of, this is the first time I've come to anything like this. I come from a culture of I'm the helper, I don't ask for help, and I've lived most of my life that way. Um, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, my own health, health issues have popped up and have required me to reach out for help, not just for myself, but for my child. Um, we are now at 12 and hormones are starting to rage. He is almost as tall as I am and the point's going to become soon where I'm not physically going to be able to deal with him. He has some self-aggression issues um, but can be very loving. There is medication. So it's now, I guess the, my point is, is the quality of life aspect is I have no quality of life. My personal life is non-existent. This is my Friday night. Um, maybe a little Hawaii Five-0. <laughs> but other than that, I'm lucky to see the outside of work or the house because there's so much to do that I have to do by myself. And trying to manage financially in an expensive area um, and manage his needs and give him some quality time, something lacks all the time. Um, and so that really is the basis for all of our issues at home. He feels that I'm not there enough for him, um, and I don't feel I'm there enough for him. I'm no longer involved with the school very much, other than a texting relationship with the principal, because I work um, right now. I've just started a new job, and it's very demanding, and I travel through the Lower Mainland, and so it's it's very difficult. I don't know what's going on at the school and when I was there I had a better idea when I worked part-time or when I was at home. I gave up my career and my finishing my education to be a parent and to be the therapist and to be the 24-7 and I don't regret that but our quality of life going forward is very questionable. Especially mine and a healthy parent will lead to a healthy child and I know that but sacrificing has, has proven to be um, somewhat detrimental and finding a way around that would be helpful and if I had the solution I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> Can I comment on that because it was me that raise the sort of additional burden, I think, of bringing up someone with ASD as a single parent. Um, we, we've heard a lot this evening about uh, schools, and the issue in the UK is no uh, different from here in terms of there being uh, huge variation between schools. Schools are uh, cultures that hang around individuals and the, the nature of the principle uh, tends to have a huge impact on the ethos of the school and the way that people uh, approach things. And my advice to parents in the UK when I was seeing a lot of young children was that if they couldn't find an appropriate school for their child in a, a reasonable travelling range, and I used to say that a reasonable travelling range was 50 miles, uh, given the sort of nature of England, then they should contemplate moving. Uh, and that thought came back to me when you were saying uh, that your home now is BC. But I think if the reality is that there is access to a support network elsewhere that potentially might transform your quality of life, so you're not keeping six balls in the air at once, then, then actually the sacrifice of moving may, may bring such benefits uh, to you that it's worthwhile. And I really want to generalise that to the, to the point that it, it's not just single parents, it's isolated families. Um, I do a lot of work up in Prince George and I saw a family a few weeks ago who'd come down from Fort St John. Well, if you're an isolated family with a kid in Fort St. John, you, you are in serious uh, trouble. We can all come here this evening. Most of us have not travelled uh, very far. We can exchange views. If you live in a remote, 
isolated area, uh, then, then everything becomes much harder. And so I think what really helps quality of life is thinking where are the support networks for my family? Where, where do I have to go uh, to get that? And our sort of, uh, if you like, Protestant nature tends to make us feel it's our responsibility to do everything ourselves. Uh, but the reality is most of our relatives and good friends would be only too eager to chip in if we were to ask them. Yep. are very yep. limited yep. and the economy is not great yep. so my ability to provide would be questionable there yeah. as well yeah. and that's yeah. kind of no, it's tricky. that I've had yeah. to look at and decide yeah. long term and my son's father is here and so yep. by moving him um, any issues. relationship that they have which is minimal yep. but it's there and, and that's another factor I've had to consider yes. but mostly it's the economy and, and the lack of services in that rural area um, that, that prevent me from, from going there. Okay. Well, I, I think one of the things um, that we've sort of collectively learned over the years is that when people come together, uh, they generate <coughs> developments that wouldn't arise by the person trying to do something by themselves. And I can see that there would be advantages to bringing single parents together of kids with ASD, in part because actually if you can manage your son, you might be able to manage another one for one evening a week and then someone else could do the same for you. I, I think why we've been chatting with families ac across and, and this issue of support, a support network and, and many families find it, it's, it's, I'm really happy to see you here tonight. You're saying it's your first time out at one of these events. So I think this is sometimes where we start to get those supports. But other families, you know, and I made a joke about Facebook when we started, but there are many uh, groups, uh, especially up north, that have created Facebook pages just for families with uh, in the area with kids with ASD so that at 3 o'clock in the morning when they don't know what to do about something, they can type it in and, and you know, the ne by the next day, you know, parents say, I've got a list of, of things that you know, I, I tried this issue at Safeway, and this is what people said. And or, or you can even vent that on on the on the thing. And the next morning, the mum's saying, "Oh, I had like five parents agree with me, and it just made me feel like I had someone there, even though they weren't there as well." So if there's a way too for families in in this uh, audience today to, you know, every time we go to do an outreach, you're trying to get families to connect with each other, and for someone to start something like that in in their community and I know that they they do exist because sometimes a virtual support um, is, is is not probably as good as the other but also very helpful for increasing quality of life I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments first I really wanted to thank you for sharing a, your your experience and and I and I just wanted to comment because one of the things that and now I'm really talking as a parent but one of the things that's been profoundly important to me over time has been connecting with other families because often our our journeys are so marked with um, trauma in grocery stores or restaurants or you know I can name 30 other places that many of you will or or the good things that we might not have others to connect with and celebrate but one of the things that I thought was really really important about how you shared what you shared is you brought humor to yeah, it yeah, and your reflection yeah. and I really want to commend you for yeah, that because yeah. it demonstrates resiliency and one of the things that is so true is I mean families are funny families are fantastic and families are amazing and lots of us have struggles as we have rifts and changes in our family dynamics and relationships but when we're making decisions that are about our sons and daughters best interests and and um, then taking opportunities like tonight to come out and connect with other families and maybe learn something new or explore some other things so I, I just think it was so fabulous to hear from you and hear about your perspective and thank you for sharing that yeah I have a funny child <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me not long ago and told me I was looking fatter than usual so should, uh, join the biggest for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Very literal. I just um, want to... Um, we're actually a few minutes over, uh, like 15 minutes over our time, so I'm not sure that we can have 
other questions. I do have a written question from the back, and uh, what would be your predilection? Would it be to... We have one more question. That lady is the lady in the... That's right, and I have it written down. Oh, oh. And so, would you The lady like in the blue has been waiting as well. Uh, so, I have a question down there. Basically, I would like the ministry to open up the $22,000 for understates funding to counseling. Especially counseling for parents when they receive the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went through the same journey as the other parent. I'm a single parent. I got two children. They're both on the spectrum. What helped me the most to get the quality of life that I have today is not behavioral consultant, not SLP, not social worker. It's actually a counselor that I found to help me understand my journey, help me to set my goals and set my path, and also help me to independently assess the behavioral consultants, SLPs that I hired, and help me to fire them and hire some <laughs> I, 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 I need I the name agree. of the counselor for the list. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Karen. I, I agree, and, I, and it, it is something that I. I, I can't make announcements. I'm not an announcement. I don't have the ability to make announcements. But it's definitely that is something that uh, we're taking a look at what services are eligible and ineligible. And we're finding the more and more the need for a navigator role for families, exactly. right? Uh, uh, and um, that navigator role can be in the form of many different types of people, such as a family counselor, a psychologist could do that, someone who's sort of a key worker for autism, that sort of stuff. But I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I, I think you will be seeing some changes in the future a, around the, the the ability for families to have someone who can help guide them through that process. So um, in the UK a few years ago, the National Autistic Society was given uh, a large donation by Vodafone, one of the big mobile phone companies, to roll out a national program where called Early Bird um, and parents of newly diagnosed children could go to a course that was either a, a two-day course or um, six evenings or six half days at the weekend, um, really giving a sort of primer on autism uh, and all the things associated uh, with autism. I mean, clearly you could do that through pamphlets and DVDs and online courses, but, but I think there was a huge benefit to these new small group of newly diagnosed parents coming together um, and exchanging uh, views and, and forming relationships that persisted. And actually it wouldn't be that difficult for us to set something like that up uh, in BC because it's not rocket science. Okay, I, um, unfortunately we have to wrap it up. Um, I thank everyone for taking their Friday evening, which is so precious to all of you who work hard at home and, and outside the home. Thank you so much. If you ha still have comments or questions, please I encourage you to contact us, uh, addl at sfu.ca or, or Emily specifically, um, and give us your input or tell us that you want to participate in the uh, quality of life research we would really appreciate that we hope that this um, initiative and this research will help shed some light on um, some of those issues that you brought up so that uh, we can have more sort of organized uh, uh, data to look at to say you know what are the issues that people in BC are um, are uh, uh, talking about and need support um, in supporting their children. Thank you very much. <laughs>